Now, we want to get on to hearing from Mason Weaver, who is my longtime friend. I'm just so happy that he has moved to St. Louis. He's a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley. He survived. I know, I know that wasn't easy because I have one son who survived uh, that same course out there. Uh, he worked for a while with the Department of Energy and a private consulting company. He's the author of five books, including one called It's OK to Leave the Plantation. He would like to get people off of dependency on government. And now he is very much available as a motivational speaker. I hope many of you will have him speak for your groups. Uh, he's a longtime friend. He's now moved from California to Jefferson County. Please welcome Mason Weaver. Thank you very much. I appreciate my, my good friend, Phyllis Shafi for, for, for that great introduction, and thank you, Joan, for inviting me out to all you, you wonderful folks here. It's really, really great to be back home. I never thought I would return here. 43 years in the wilderness called California, the land of fruits and nuts. Um, I was born here in St. Louis, 1950. My mother was able to go to a hospital called Homer G. Phillips Hospital. Now, Homer G. Phillips Hospital was created by Dr. Homer G. Phillips because black women could not give birth to their children in the hospital here in St. Louis. He didn't protest, he didn't demonstrate, he didn't ask for a government grant, he just built a hospital. So I was, I was born in Homer G. Phillips. My mother looked at me and my older brother at age of eight, nine, and 10 and thought we were heading in the wrong direction. And instead of begging and boring and crying and whining and asking for government handouts, she moves us out into the deep, deep country of Jefferson County, where I grew up. Now, I was raised in St. Louis, but in Jefferson County, I ran across these things called um, white folks. <laughs> and it was interesting, you know, I mean, really, it was interesting. I found out that white folks wasn't like the story I heard on the news and in papers. They were actually humans. Um, if you cut one, they bleed. Uh, if they cut you, you'll bleed. I grew up in this little small town in Jefferson County, and I had friends, and I had enemies, and I, and, but no one cared in, in the DeSolo school system how I did in school. They didn't care if I was a poor black kid. They didn't care if I came from a broken family, they didn't care. They only cared, did I do the work? And I was very happy for that because I could do the work. But in St. Louis, I had a program that I was gonna be kept two years in the fifth grade because of special program, special program for more money for them. But in DeSoto, I was able to graduate or prepare to graduate a year early. And I, I was ready to graduate. I go to my student council, my, my council whose job it was to Give me to college. And I wanted to go to college, and he said, Mason, why would you want to go to college? The, the guidance counselor. Why would you want to go to college, Mason? All you would do is take a seat away from a more deserving white kid. Let me call out to the shoe factory and see if I can get you a job with the other colored boys. Now, folks, he wasn't doing that out of hatred. I want you to understand what I'm going to say tonight. Racism is not about hatred of somebody's race. He just did not want me to compete against his kid. That's all. He just didn't want me to compete against his children. And I was thinking, what an idiot. <laughs> I'm, I mean, you're not going to stop me from going to college. So I ignored him. And I go down to the gym, to the basketball court. I, I went to an all-white school, so I never knew how really good I was at basketball. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying. <laughs> And uh, the coach was talking to the team about the upcoming year. We we're going to do pretty good that year. And he asked, well, what about Mason, you know, uh, the tall black kid that <laughs> scores all the points. Uh, anyway, he, he said, well, we're not going to start Mason. We're going to play him often, but we don't want him to get a scholarship from you white kids. What's the personal? Didn't bother me. I walked around the, uh, the steps and told the coach, uh, you don't have to worry about me next year. 
I'm not going to be here. You're not going to let me graduate. You're not going to let me, you're gonna let me pretend like I'm a student. I'm going to quit high school. And I went on a bus to St. Louis on April the 4th, 1968, to join the Navy. And when I came back and got that bus, <clears throat> I couldn't catch a cab because they didn't pick up people who looked like me. Uh, I couldn't make a phone call to Bus Cafe, but a kid came up to me, one of my classmates came up to me, gleeful, happy. He said, Mason, have you heard the news? They killed Dr. King. And he was happy. I just joined the Navy to go defend my country. And I wasn't sure what kind of country I had, but it didn't bother me. It didn't bother me. I was okay with that. You can be happy. I can be sad. That's America. It wasn't personal. I go in the Navy, I go to Vietnam, they get a scratch on me. People always ask me, how, why did I leave St. Louis and go to the Navy and go to Vietnam? I went to, to, to Vietnam to get out of St. Louis because at least in Vietnam, we got to shoot back. <laughs> See, you folks here know what I'm talking about. See, if I was in Cleveland, they wouldn't know what I was talking about. But <laughs> I go to Vietnam, they get, didn't get a scratch on me. I came back to San Diego and I'm debating the racial tensions going on in my country at the time. And I'm debating against a, a known white racist on my ship. And quite honestly, I was a black racist. I was a black militant, had my alpha with a pick in it, kind of hard with a white hat in the Navy. And we're debating the issues of the day. I'm just thinking that we're just competitors. I played basketball. Competitor, you know, you, you play, he beat you one day, you, you practice, beat him the next day. I thought he was a competitor. I've been to Vietnam. I knew what an enemy was. One day I ordered my competitor to help me move 2,800 pounds of steel so I can work on it before I went on vacation. And I looked at my competitor in the hallway while he had control of 2,800 pounds of steel. And my competitor had the look in his eye and I knew instantly he was not a competitor. He was the enemy. And I saw him put his shoulders to it and push it over on me. I turned to run to get out the way, it hit me on my left hip and crushed me to that wall and broke my hips and crushed my ribs against the wall and broke three ribs and crushed my steel helmet in as I hit that wall. I screamed with my eyes shut and opened my eyes up and I looked this man in the eye. I have never seen that much hatred in another human being in my life. And that look on his face, I was done. I was done with America. I was done with white folks. I was done with trying to make people like me. I was done. My body was crushed. My ribs were broken. My spleen was ruptured. My bladder was ruptured. And I was done. And I wanted nothing more in life than to recover my injuries, to become strong enough to one day put my arms around his neck and squeeze that look off his face. And I didn't care where I found him. I didn't care if he was in front of the police department. I was going to go to jail. I was going to take that look off his face. That anger at all those racial things in Missouri and all the racial things on the ship, that anger came down on me so hard, I threw away all reason. See, once you accept something that's true, you lock it in a box. It was true. White people hated me. White people owed me. And I began to associate with other people that believed the things I believed about America and myself. We had a pity party. You know, white men owed me something. White men owe me this, owe me that. And I went to Berkeley and I ran across the Black Panther Party, was found in Oakland. And they hated everything. <laughs> and you get to feed it to yourself. I started working for Ron Dellums, the communist ex mayor of Oakland, of uh, uh, Berkeley, became U.S. congressman. Hated America, tell you that. I worked for Pete Stark and George Miller. I campaigned for Alan Cranston. Well, my dashiki, I took Swahili. I have a degree in black history. I was everything you feared. I was dangerous. And I'm here to tell you about black liberalism, how I came out of it, why I came out of it. I began to think there's only one thing powerful enough to get that blind hatred out of you. There's only one thing powerful enough to get you out of that deep spiral of depression and hatred. There's only one thing capable of making you human again. And that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing else. I, I 
I have this emptiness in me because of the testimony of the lifestyle of people I know around me. I can only go back to, to the witness of my father and grandfather and people I knew believed in God because I was hopeless, I was helpless, I knew I needed help, and everybody around me, every social input was telling me that America owed me, I was helpless, I was hopeless, I was useless, the Navy said I was disabled, and I began to look for Christ. I didn't know if you seek, you're fine. And I'm gonna tell you the whole story of, of my conversion, but it was instant. It was life-changing, and all of a sudden I realized that Jesus Christ could, you know, could not or would not or did not compromise with me on that cross. And therefore, I could not compromise with him in the world. And the first thing you had to do, you want to end racial tension in this country? You want to end racial hate, discrimination in this country? You have to forgive. I had to forgive that white shipmate, the guy who I vowed if I ever saw him again, I would take his life. I had to forgive him before he forgave himself before he asked for apology, before he said he was sorry, before affirmative action, before the food stamp program, before all the benefits, I had to forgive him. And when I forgave him, I was able then to participate in the American dream. How could I own a business in a country with 80% black, 80% folks were white, I hated white folks. Make any sense? But I began to look, I still had this racial identity given on me by the liberals. I still thought I was inferior. They would say things like, Black folks were African kings and queens. Okay, what happened? What happened? You're gonna celebrate the African kingdoms, but I'm here in change now, what happened? And I began to look for that. And I'm gonna tell you what I found in that journey, in that search. I looked for two things. Because I was a new Christian, I looked at slavery in the Bible. And because I was an old militant, I looked for slavery out of Africa. And I found a parallel. Black folks, in, I'm, black folks in America, or the black slave trade, lasted about 420 years. In 420 years, we lost our language, our history, our culture. We lost our own identity. I can't tell you what tribe I came from. The Jews were separated out of Egypt, of Israel, for 2,000 years. In every country, on every continent, embraced in every country. They didn't have a Jewish enclave where they only spoke Hebrew. They, they in, in, embraced themselves in the culture in, in Greece and Ireland and England and Russia and Germany and South America and the United States. They became those citizens, but they still were Jews. For 2,000 years, no country ever spoke Hebrew as a national language. For 2,000 years, no nation ever kept the feast days as a national holiday. For 2,000 years, the Jewish customs were not embedded in any nationality. But on day one, 1948, Jews came from Ireland, Sweden, Germany, America speaking Hebrew back to Israel with their language still intact, with their customs still intact, and their history still intact. Black folks came out of captivity in America could only speak broken English. And I will ask myself the question, what was the difference? Why is it that the Jews came out of the whole world back to Israel speaking their language? Because those Jewish mothers in the kitchens in Ireland and Germany and Russia, those Jewish mothers taught their children who they were. Taught the language, taught the custom, taught the tradition, and taught them why, gave them the names and why they had the names. The African slave trade in America, the first thing they did was to destroy the family. Took the man out of the home. Took the encouragement to protect the children, gave it the master. On the slave trade in America, we became wars of master, not wars of ourselves. That's the difference. That's why liberals hate the family. That's why they hate manhood. That's why they hate depending on your family. That's why they have cliches in the black community saying, Give something back to the community. Who wants to owe the community? Give me the bill. You never hear them say, give something back to the family, to your wife, to your kids. The problem in the black community is that there's no family. 
There's no family structure. On the plantation, you never had the need of a family. This is called tribalism. My, my latest book, Tribalism. It is a fact that on the tribe, the master gets all the freedom. He gets all the women. He gets all the power. That's why Bill Clinton can do what he did and still be at the convention speaking. <laughs> Tribalism. This is why Jesse Jackson can have an out of wedlock baby, bring the pregnant woman to the White House and still be a leader. He's a tribal chief. It doesn't matter. That's why you see black communities, poor black churches. And the congregation is poor, and they brag about the preacher's Cadillac. Tribalism. When you challenge the thinking, you are challenging the tribal instincts to support the tribal chief. Liberalism is an abusive belief. If you ever seen a, a, an abused woman, she's not being abused for lack of knowledge. You guys think liberals just have to be explained to. They just don't understand. Let me explain. You just go tell them this. The liberals don't care about the truth. They care about the tribe. Your, your, your truthfulness is irrelevant to them because they don't believe what they're saying. <laughs> they don't believe what they're saying. They just want to give you something to argue about because you are talking facts, and facts is like a brick to a liberal's head. <laughs> it's painful for them. So they get off track by making you think and defend yourself. You start debating with a liberal, and in 30 seconds they call your name. You're mean, you're racist, you're rich. They call your name because you stop discussing the facts and start defending yourself. Who cares if you're a racist? I don't care if you're a racist. I had a, a, a neighbor in California that flew the Confederate flag. Bless his heart. I was a talk show host. He knew I was a talk show host. He knew my beliefs. He was a, a liberal school teacher, union member, and he flew a Confederate flag. And one day he said, Mason, does this flag offend you? I said, why would your flag offend me? He said, well, you know, you people. I said, what you mean? You mean tall, handsome, rich black men? What are we talking about? <laughs> you people. He said, well, you know, what is the flag represent to you? What the symbolizes to you? I said, your flag symbolizes the flag of the losers. <laughs> you lost. As a matter of fact, matter of fact, since the victors usually take the flag of the vanquished, I'm going to buy me one of the flags. <laughs> I can step on it. it. Why would I get upset? with the symbolism. They want you to be upset behind the symbolism of things. The truth hurts liberals. So the only way you can convert a liberal is to make them think. You cannot think and stay a liberal. You can only feel and stay a liberal. How you feel about it. How does that make you feel, Mason? You can't make me feel. If you make a liberal think, you have not converted a conservative. Demystifying the liberal thought in the black community is easy, folks, because most black folks are conservative individually. But the tribe is liberal. So we'll give up our individuality for the tribe. But if you make something personal and conservative, we will win. Let me give you an example before I close here. In California, Obama got 95% of the vote in California. And not surprising. But we also had a proposition called Prop 8, homosexuality, gay marriages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, guess what, folks? Black folks, black folks said, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute now. That became between your beliefs and my God. Now it's my God and your beliefs. Obama is cool. He's the black guy. I can vote for him. He's cool. Like, 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 like supporting a black boxer. He's the black guy. I can support him. But God and me, 72% of black voters voted against same-sex marriage, 72%. Now, not just that though, in, in liberal California, Prop 8 was successful in every county. I'm talking about San Francisco. I'm talking about LA, every county. When you put the issue between God and them, 
That's why they hate God so much. They hate the truth and they want you to be silent because when you speak the truth, it never, ever, ever comes back void. The reason liberals hate the truth so much, the truth will compel you to act. If you accept the truth about any topic, you are compelled to act and they are afraid of what the truth will turn them into. This election cycle, let's be free. This election cycle, let's not be afraid to take the truth wherever we are. It will never come back void. This election cycle, you have young men like me, 20 and 30 years ago, angry, frustrated, hateful, scared, and embarrassed. But the truth will tear away that emotion. The truth will bring the light of day. The truth will create in each one of them the ability, the desire to take care of their own. They will stand up and they will join you and we will take back our nation. God bless you. God bless America.